If you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. At one time, all of us, if you're a teenager and above, were young, naive, uh, fairly compliant, obedient children. But then something happened. As we transitioned into our teen years the world begins to whisper into our ears, you don't have to do anything that you don't want to do. You don't have to do anything that anybody tells you to do. You do what you want to do. Find out life for yourself. You know, they used to have a phrase, uh, I don't understand it because I didn't live back when it came around, but, you know, sow your wild oats. You know, teens need to sow their wild oats. And so when teens begin to rebel against their parents, against authority, and I'm not saying that because any of you do that here. I'm saying it because I did it at one time and still struggle with it. But when that begins to take place, even Christian parents turn a blind eye and we just chalk it up to that's typical teen behavior. That's just what teens do, right? Teens are going to mess up. They're going to let you down. They're going to disappoint you. And when we have that idea, we are guilty of despising youth and shame on us as parents and Christian mentors or wherever we fall into that. When we expect teens to mess up and make mistakes, what are they going to do? 
you're going to mess up and make mistakes. And shame on us because that is looking down on you because of your youth. But I want you to know the Bible places a much different emphasis on you. The Bible expects, God expects so much more than you. And not only does he expect it, he believes in you and knows you can live up to that. In Mark chapter 10, verses 13 and 14, the people were bringing their children to Jesus. And I expected, I expect, I assume, I guess, they were pretty young children. And his disciples were getting pretty upset with this. And they kind of, I guess, rebuked the parents. They probably said, Jesus didn't have time for that. Jesus got other things to do, better things to do than, than, you know, hug and, and pinch your baby's cheek. It's probably something like that. But Jesus was upset with that and he rebuked them and he he invited the children to him he said let the children come to me do not hinder them for such belongs the kingdom of god there was something or there is something in a child that we are to emulate and jesus took these children in his arms maybe he set them in his laps he blessed them he laid their hands on them You know, I don't know exactly what Jesus did, but as a man, he was approachable by these children. And he invited them, and he loved them. On his second missionary journey, Paul, he came across and found a young disciple, a young man, young boy, if you will, named Timothy. We don't know how old he was, probably his teenage years uh, during this time. And he was... In Acts chapter 16 and verse 2, the Bible tells us that he was spoken well of by the church in Lystra and Iconium. Even as a teenager, 15 and 16, which I suppose a number of you are here this evening, he was already spoken very highly and thought very well of as a teenager in the church. And Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him on his missionary journeys. There was something about Timothy that impressed Paul. Something about this teenage Young man that impressed Paul, that Paul said, I want this guy to come with me. I want him to be a part of what I'm doing. I want him to be a part of evangelizing and teaching and converting and establishing and strengthening the church as I travel. And throughout the book of Acts, we see just how important and beneficial Timothy becomes to Paul. So much so that in Philippians 2, Paul says, I have no one like him. An amazing Young man, and as a young adult, Timothy is encouraged by Paul in these words, First Timothy four and verse twelve: "Let no one despise you for your youth, or let no one look down on you because you are young, but set an example, or be uh, the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in faith, or in love, in faith, in purity." These encouraging words shows us that Jesus expects so much more than what the world says out of Christian teenagers, out of you guys. And he knows you can live up to it. We're going to look at some key principles this evening. There's some application of those, three of them that we're going to take right out of 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12. I'm going to give all three of them to you, then we'll go through them. And this isn't just for teens. This is a lesson that anybody, uh, I think, can benefit from. But the first one is, Age does not determine Christian maturity. Number two, youth have a responsibility to the church. And number three, we need to behave like disciples. Number one, age does not determine Christian maturity. Although, uh, Timothy, when Paul wrote this in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12, it's possible he may have been in his early 30s. When he says, let no one despise your youth, we go all the way back to Acts 16, uh, verse 2. As a teenage boy, he was already highly spoken of and thought well of. Uh, He was already an example to believers as a youth. And too often, we buy into and we... It's our fault as, as uh, older Christians, I guess. And then we, uh, you, youth, y'all live, live up to it because it's our fault. We pretty much say when it comes to young people or youth in the church that the philosophy is you're, 
you don't have the ability to, to serve uh, adequately. You don't have the spiritual knowledge that you need. You're not mature. You know, when in reality, Christian growth and maturity is based on a knowledge and application of God's Word. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. Christian maturity is based on the application and knowledge of God's words. Christian growth begins the moment that you put your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ to save you. Christian maturity begins there and it grows as you get older. Consider some exhortations to Timothy about maturing in the faith. Paul says, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made known to all people. 1 Timothy 2 verse 1. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 16. Now there's great gain in godliness with contentment. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life. 1 Timothy 6 verse 11 and 12. Keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 14. Maturity, Christian maturity, is not determined by age. Paul says it is determined by a life of prayer, personal examination, learning to be content, pursuing what is right, working in the kingdom, keeping God's commandments. The practice and application of these things is what will help you grow. There are Christians of the age of 80 who have been Christians for 60 plus years who are not mature Christians. They've lived life a whole lot longer than you have, experienced a whole lot more things than you have, and you can still be a lot more spiritually mature than they are. It's sad to say, but age does not determine Christian maturity. Number two, young people, and along with all of us, you have a responsibility to the church. We all have a responsibility to grow in our love and our service and our faith to God and His people. Youth does not exempt you from your responsibility at school. They still expect you to do homework, right? Youth does not exempt you from your responsibility if you have a job. You're still expected to be there on time and serve in whatever capacity you are. Youth does not exempt you from your responsibility that you have in the home. It may determine a level of responsibility, but it doesn't exempt you from responsibility. And neither does it in the Lord's church. If you are a New Testament Christian, it doesn't matter if you're 13, 14, 15, 16, or 80, you have a responsibility to the Lord and His church. And as we look at Timothy, Paul placed a fair amount of responsibility on Timothy, and it started with simply being an example of, to the other believers. Well, what's an example? You look at the Bible word for example, and it's a pattern to follow. It's an impression that you make on somebody else. Maybe the person sitting next to you. Maybe somebody else in your youth group. Maybe somebody at your school. Maybe be somebody in your family or your church family. What kind of impression are you making on them? You know, Paul said, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Hopefully that's the impression that you're making. You're impressing on others Jesus Christ. They see that in you and they're patterning their life after you. And if so, then they're patterning their life after Jesus Christ. That's the one that we hope that we're patterning. What would others be imitating if they were imitating you? You know, when I was in high school, I had a couple groups of friends. I had this group of friends and that group of friends, and you're, you're there too. I know you have them. Everybody does. Sometimes when we get older, we forget uh, what it's like to be a teenager, and we just walk through life blind and allow our children to do anything and do everything. But you have two set of friends just like I did. Around this group of friends, I could do just about anything I wanted and get away with it. With this group of friends, I know I better watch what I say and watch what I do because it's probably going to get back to my parents. This group of friends, it wasn't going to get back to my parents because if it did, it'd get back to theirs too, you know? And so I had to watch what I did with some, and I could be a little more careless with others. 
Believe it or not, there are Christians, young and old, that look up to you. You may have a little brother, a little sister that looks up to you. You may have a, a best friend whose little brother, or little sister looks up to you. They're watching you. There are people in the, your home congregations that are older than you that look up to you. What pattern or impression are your actions making on them? Young people, you have a responsibility to develop a close relationship with Jesus Christ that can be patterned by others. You have the responsibility of being an example to others. Number three, we need to behave like disciples. We need to behave like disciples. If you're going to mature in your faith and be an example to other believers, we need to act like believers. We need to act like disciples of Jesus Christ. Your actions must reflect someone who has counted the cost, who has decided to die to self, who is bearing the cross daily and following after Jesus Christ. Paul gives Timothy a list of behaviors to, uh, to exemplify. This was an exhaustive list. Maybe it just started here and, and, and gave in to the others. But he said, be an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and in purity. I'm going to look at each one of these just very bl- briefly. Speech. In other words, pick your words wisely. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up Ephesians 4 and verse 29. Our words need to be gracious. They need to be seasoned with salt, Colossians 4 and verse 6. You know, when we were little, we sang a song, Be careful, little mouth, what you say. That's not just for our little ones. That's for, that's for everybody who's a disciple of Jesus Christ. We need to watch what we say. And again, my group of friends, I knew I could say some things around some that I couldn't say around the others. That's not good. I need to be careful what I say no matter who I'm with and where I'm at. Conduct. Disciples of Jesus Christ need to put off the old man and his practices and put on the new self, creating the likeness of of God and true righteousness and holiness, Colossians 3, 9, and 10, Ephesians 4 and verse 24. As a Christian, God lives inside of us. We are the home of the Holy Spirit. And our conduct, our actions need to reflect that. Are we being led by the Spirit? Love. We need to love the way Jesus loves. If our motivation for everything we do as a disciple of Jesus Christ is not motivated by love, Paul tells us 1 Corinthians 13, we're nothing but a loud, obnoxious, annoying noise. And it doesn't matter. Allow your heart to be full of compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, forgiveness, as Jesus freely forgives you. Love binds everything together in perfect harmony. Colossians 4, verses 12 through 14. We need to be loved because God is love. 1 John 4 and verse 8. We need to be loved because everything that Jesus did was because of love. We need to be examples in faith. A young disciple that exhibits a faithfulness understands that they belong to Jesus Christ, that you have submitted yourself to his lordship, and you live in obedience no matter the cost. Be steadfast, immovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. Sometimes, sometimes faithfulness to Jesus Christ means that you have to, it always means you do what's right. But sometimes it means you have to do what's right when nobody else is. On Fridays, I'm able to take our daughters to school. And as we run, we drive through the, the line to drop them off, uh, I say a prayer with them, and I don't, I don't like telling things about myself. I don't say this to brag myself, but this is what I want my girls to do. I pray with them, and I usually say something along the lines. I mean, they're only in, in uh, first grade and fourth grade. But I pray that they will do what is right, even if nobody else does, that they will have the courage to do what is right. And I hope they remember that. I hope they develop that and they keep doing that. So when the time comes and nobody else is doing what is right, that they will reflect Jesus Christ and be an example, not only to believers, but to the rest of the world and being faithful and doing what is right. Now, I read, you know, Luke 14, we see about the the cost of discipleship and somebody's going to, you know, you're going to sit down and before you build a tower, you're going to see, make sure you have enough money. 
There's one author, and, the, and his, his name escapes him, but I like what he said. He says, too many times the landscape of discipleship is, built with, is, is scattered with half-built towers. We're faithful to a point, and we realize it's not what we want to do anymore, and we leave. We've got to be an example. When it's tough, when it's easy, when everybody's doing what's right, and when nobody's doing what's right. We've got to be faithful. Let's keep going. Purity. Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. 2 Timothy 2, verse 22, we've had a, a whole lesson over it. Purity is so much more than sexual. Please, please understand this. It is so, so much more than what is sexual. What movies do you watch? What uh, songs do you listen to? Where do you go? What jokes do you tell? There's so much more that goes with pure than just the thought of lust. What do you think about? All that goes in your heart and it affects your purity. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. That defiles a person, Jesus says, Matthew 15 and verse 18. If you talk dirty, you're impure. If you think dirty, you're impure. It doesn't have to be sexual. It doesn't have to. All it has to be is just, you know, cursing, profanity. Be an example in purity. Well, how do we apply these, these principles? Number one, you have to train yourself for godliness. Train yourself for godliness. Spiritual maturity doesn't happen with little effort. I didn't graduate from college just because I wanted to. You're not going to graduate from high school just because you want to. You're going to have to put work into it. And the same thing when it comes to our spiritual life, the process of becoming like Jesus. We have to decrease. He has to increase. John the the Mercer said that. But that process takes some spiritual sweat. All right? It takes some work. It takes some hard work. You have to train yourself for godliness. You know, you spend approximately seven hours a day, Monday through Friday, in a classroom of some kind. And your teachers expect you to go home every night and do your homework, right? It's the same thing for being like Jesus. We put too much emphasis on worldly. No, don't get me wrong. Education is good. We need education. Don't get me wrong. But we put... Too many times the wrong emphasis on worldly things instead of what is spiritual. We train ourselves for academics among so many other things, but the same energy that we put towards these worldly pursuits needs to be put in being like Jesus Christ. Notice the words that Paul uses in the immediate context of 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. I'm going to list them to you. Paul uses words like train. Verses 6 and 7. Tool, verse 10. Strive, verse 10. Devote, verse 13. Practice, verse 15. Persist, verse 16. If I didn't know any better, I would think that my my coach was giving me a pep talk on the ball field. But Paul says to Timothy, this is about training yourself for godliness. Not for who can hit a home run and, and run the bases the fastest. Nobody has a strong faith simply because they want a strong faith. You know, I look at these preachers who have been preaching for over a century, it seems like. And I'm thinking, man, I hope one day I can be like that. But i got to tell myself, you know, I, don't, I can't just fall asleep. I don't fall asleep in the office. That's a bad example. I can't just wish <laughs> that I had this knowledge and could quote Scripture like that. I've got to do something about it. I've got to put in some spiritual sweat, the same kind of diligent work that these men did, if I'm going to know God's Word like that and put it into practice. You can't be godly and Christ-like or spiritual through desire alone. Train yourself in the disciplines of prayer, Bible study, and service, and I promise you, God will bless you and you will grow. Number two, the days of your youth, and this goes completely against what the world says, and that's good because if, if Christianity doesn't go against what the world says, we're doing it wrong. The days of your youth are, a, are the vital time to cultivate and build a relationship with God. 
Teens, you are expected to excel in academics. You are expected, if you're on a sports team, to put in your very best. And not just put in your very best, you're expected to train and train and train and train. You're expected to do uh, to the best of your ability and perform your job where it is that you may be employed. But parents, we don't expect the same thing of our kids when it comes to spiritual matters. And teens, let me ask you, you know Think about this and then go home and talk about it with your parents. Do your parents expect you to memorize God's word? Do they expect you to look for ways to serve? Do your parents expect you to grow in your prayer life? Do your, your parents expect you to read and study your Bible daily? If they don't, go home and sit down and have a conversation with them. You can ask your parents to sit down and say, what are we going to do about this? You can do that. I'd encourage you to do that. I wish I'd have done that. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1. When the wisest man to ever live speaks, we need to stop and listen. He later says, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. Timothy says, 2 Timothy 3 verse 15 was taught the scriptures from his childhood very early on his mother and his grandmother they taught him the scriptures he may not have liked it in the very beginning probably didn't he may have complained a little bit about it mom why do we have to memorize deuteronomy this week but you know what in the end when he was older in life and he became you know why he was useful to paul You know why Paul said he had nobody else like him? You know why Paul left him and could leave him behind and knew that things were going to be taken care of within the church? Because his parents did that. His mom and his grandmother took the time. And he cultivated a a, a relationship with God. Use the days of your youth to grow close to God. It's a very, very important thing time because it allows you to to develop a foundation and then grow on it from there on number three actively look for ways to be an example you know paul lists a number of ways there in first Timothy four and verse 12 how to be an example and paul gives timothy uh, or he tells him how he tells him to pray there's some other things he tells him in, in First and Second Timothy. To pray, to teach, to watch yourself, be content, pursue righteousness, fight the good fight of faith, endure evil, be patient and be ready. And he says, practice these things, immerse yourself into these things so that all may see your progress. In other words, when you do these, you're going to be an example and people are going to see that. Look for ways to be an example. I think personally... We fail youth in the church in this way. We teach and teach and teach. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. But then what? We don't give you a way to do it. We tell you what to do, but we don't tell you how to do it. We don't provide you a way to do it. We don't say, hey, come along with me. Let me show you how to do it. If you see something in your home church that you want to do, let me encourage you to do it. You can be a leader and start some kind of ministry. You know, Jesus talks about feeding you know, uh, the hungry, uh, clothing the naked, visiting those in prison, taking care of the sick. James says, visit the widows and orphans. If your church isn't doing that, why can't you start it? You have the ability to do so you got a brain. You're excelling in school. And I'm not trying to speak uh, down to you. I'm telling you what you can accomplish with God's help. You can do that. It's a way for you to be an example to the believers and give God the glory. Don't pat yourself on the back when it starts. Give God the glory. Seize opportunities to be godly examples to others. Titus 2 and verse 7, be a model of good works. Titus 3 and verse 8, devote yourself to good works. You have the capability. In Jesus Christ, you are more than competent. You are more than adequate. By yourself, you're nothing, just like everybody else. But with Jesus Christ, you can do 
and serve and reach out in any way that you want. And he'll bless you. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and self-control, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7. I want to encourage you, do not be ashamed of your faith in Jesus Christ. Do not be ashamed of your faith in Jesus Christ. When the time comes, and it will, that you need to stand up for what is right, and you need to reflect Jesus Christ to the world, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to be easy. Because chances are, you may be the only one that's doing it. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and when all those instruments went off and everybody else bowed down, I wonder if Shadrach stood there and he said, I'm going to stand my ground. He stood up and he looks, and guess who he sees over here? Shadrach sees sees Meshach. Meshach is standing there. They go, all right, we're together. And they see Abednego, and the three of them, they stay together. They stood up. They weren't ashamed of their faith in God. You have that ability too. You have it within you. It's it's tough. It's going to be difficult. But when you do it, you're going to feel good about yourself. You're going to make Jesus Christ proud of you. And you're going to reflect good on the church. And somebody is going to say and look at you. They may not say it to you, but they're going to think in their heads. I wish I had the faith they did. I wish I had the boldness and the courage that they did. Young people, make it a priority to grow in your relationship with Jesus so that your walk of faith is worthy to be imitated and patterned by anybody that chooses to do so because somebody is. It's going to take some spiritual sweat, some godly exercise, But the days of your youth are a crucial time, the crucial time, to develop and form a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I hope that you do so. And I pray, I'm going to pray that you have so many more faithful years of service to the King of Kings and His kingdom. And I'm going to leave you with a challenge. I hinted to it just a minute ago. Young people, I want you to go home tonight, or whenever you get home. And I want you... To go to your parents, I want you to, they're probably going to have a heart attack. They want to know what's going on. Uh, I want you to invite them into the living room, maybe into around the, the, the dining room table. And I want you to tell them, Mom and Dad, I really want to grow in my faith. I know what's right. I know what I need to do. This may sound corny, and, and you may feel uncomfortable doing it. But who knows? You may come, go to church and worship Bible class all the time, but nothing spiritual takes place in your family at home. And if that's true, then it's going to be kind of awkward for you. But I want to encourage you to do it. You could be the start of a spiritual revolution in your own family. Think about that. But sit your parents down and tell them, I'm ready to grow in my faith, and I want you to help me. I want to come up with some things that I can do that I know aren't being done, and I want to grow and I want to reflect Jesus Christ to the world.